When I decided to have a look at some of the world's top performing education systems based on the, the PISA tests, I didn't want to go to countries and, and ask their, their governments or their policy departments to put me in touch with schools. Because I thought if I did that, I was going to get directed specifically towards particular schools that were seen as the best, with the best teachers. And actually, I wasn't looking to go to the world's best schools. I was looking to get an understanding of how education works across a country in those countries that perform highly in the tests of reading, maths and science. So. Initially, I actually contacted teachers, so there's three Finnish teachers here that I actually stayed with. So mainly I was staying with teachers and that was my routine. In the case of China, I went to a few schools of teachers I was staying with too. One of the schools fell through. I've been to two types of school in, in Shanghai. I've been to um, quite a, a well-to-do school in a nice area doing lots of interesting experimental stuff. Um, and I'd been to a school for migrant children, which was on the much, much poorer end. And I really wanted to go to a school that was, was in a you know, average neighbourhood of Shanghai in the suburbs, and that school had fallen through. So I decided to just go and ask them. So I, I, <laughs> the scariest thing I did is I walked up to the school. I don't speak Mandarin, um, but I did speak enough Mandarin to say, which I think means I'm English and I'm a teacher. Um, can I look at your school? Um, and the security guard looked at me with a bit of a stony face and looked a bit confused and I, so I just stood there and smiled at him I think he was expecting me to leave and I stood there and I kept smiling at him until he picked up the phone and, and said what I can only assume was there's a strained English lady outside the school please send down um, someone who speaks English so that was my route in um, to that school in China so what I did is I spent about a month um, in five different countries um, Finland, Canada, Shanghai, China, Singapore and Japan I taught wherever they would let me so I, I offered to, to teach either science which is my subject or, or English as an English speaker, um, and I did that in, in most countries I was in, um, and I interviewed people, old and young. This is my, my youngest interviewee, who was telling me about the effect of the um, Chinese communist approach to differentiation in schools. <laughs> so I, what I'm going to talk to you today is particularly around lower achievers and what we can do about that, because I think one of the main problems we have in England, certainly one of the reasons that we do not so well in the international PISA tests, so just apologies for those of you who haven't come across these tests. They're, they're probably in the news at the moment. The next round of results is coming out next week. Um, they are tests that 15-year-olds take in reading, math, and science, and that happens every three years, um, set by the OECD. So they're actually tests of, of problem solving in those subjects. And this is actually based on GCC results in England, but you can see that there's quite a long tail of underachievement. This represents lots of students who are not doing so well at all. And if you look at PISA data, um, and you look at children who are below level two. So level two is categorized by the OECD as being baseline standards that you would expect children to have to participate um, effectively in society. Um, and actually we've got, this is, this is reading, so slightly better than one in five not achieving that in, in England. And it's worse in maths and science. So about 20% of students are leaving school age 15 without proper literacy and numeracy. So I think that's a problem. I'm sure you will do as well. These key, key competitors... So Australia, Canada, Finland, Korea, Singapore, top performers in, in PISA, actually have far fewer students who are at those lower levels. So I, I wanted to know why. I just want you to reflect on, on this quote for a second. What does that mean to you? So what this means to me, um, and I think what this means to the Chinese, if one can ever say that you speak for the Chinese, is the idea that what you're born with does not determine what you're able to do. So it's a clumsy bird that flies first will get to the forest earlier. So even though this bird is clumsy, this bird is clumsier than the others, that doesn't mean he's going to miss out on whatever is in the forest because he's going to set out earlier. So applying that to education, what that means is, yes, it might be the case that some children are born finding schooling easier than others, but actually with the right input and the right effort, any child can achieve. Um, and that's fundamental. And I just want to kind of bring, bring some of that cult cultural element in because it's not all about policy, but policy and culture are intertwined in a way that I will, I will describe. So the Japanese, Japanese think so too. So this is um, a graph from a very interesting study by Hein and colleagues. Um, and what they did was they asked um, Canadian and, and Japanese students, undergraduates, to, um, to do a test. They said it was a test of creativity. They were giving them three words and asking them, what's the, what's the word that associates these three, three words? So um, they had to do this test. And some of them were given really hard versions of this test. And some were given really easy versions. They were then asked to mark it themselves. So some thought, gosh, I've done really badly. And some thought, oh, I'm really good at this. Next stage in the experiment, so what often happens in, in psychology, is there was, um, there was a breakdown. 
um, in the experiment. So, oh dear, the computer's crashed. I'll just have to pop out for a second, said the experimenter. While I'm out, have a look at this other example of the same kind of test. You can have a go if you want. Just you know, have, a, have a play if you'd like to. And, and they recorded how long the people, these students spent on this test. Really interestingly, huge cultural differences in this. So what this graph is showing us is, is essentially that for Canadian students, if they believed that they were successful, they wanted to do more. They then spent longer on the next tests. If they thought they'd failed, they didn't spend very long on it at all. Japanese students was the other way around. So when they thought that they were bad at something, when they thought they'd failed at something, that actually motivated them to spend longer on it than previously. So they're motivated by failure. So that tells you something about what they think happens when you fail and how you then go about changing that situation. Um, similarly, reflected in a, a different study, but by the same authors, asking people what percentage of intelligence is due to effort compared to talent or innate ability. European Americans said it's about 36% due to effort. Asian Americans said about 45%. Japanese, 55%. So they're saying that actually intelligence is far more about effort than it is about anything else, such as genetics. 